as I was saying, if you read papers, academic papers on the labor market, many, many papers make that assumption of bargaining between firms and workers. So that's the last thing that we can uh, study. That's what we're going to do now. So let's see what happens when we have wage bargaining. So as I was saying, it's something that in the academic literature, it's an assumption that's very common. Um, in the real world, there is some bargaining uh, that happens, but it's not only as prevalent as what the uh, literature would suggest. So I think I have some numbers here. Um, right, so in the US, if you uh, ask workers how they set wages, 30% of workers are going to say that they bargain. Um, and if you look a little bit at who these workers are, these are mostly, uh, not surprisingly, highly paid workers and highly educated workers. Okay? Um, so, for, um, so this is like individual bargaining between workers and firms. That's about 30% of the workers. And then as, we, as we've seen, um, there is also 10% of the workers who are unionized. And for these workers, their wage are determined not by individual bargaining, but by um, co um, collective bargaining. Okay? So we have 10% of workers who do collective bargaining through unions and 30% of workers who do some individual bargainings. So directly the worker bargaining with the firm. Okay? Um, so you know, it's, not, it's not nothing, so it's, it's worth exploring. Um, so what is uh, wage bargaining and how does it work? Um, so there are several ways to, so, you know, bargaining is something that happens when you have, say, a pie to split between two parties. So here the pie is a surplus from having found a worker-firm match. So as we said, once the worker and the firm get together, both of them, worker and firm, are very happy to be in that, uh, in that situation because both workers and firm, it would be quite costly for them to go back to the labor market to try to find a new worker or a new, new firm. So there is a, a surplus to share between the worker and the firm. There is a pie to split between these two. And so bargaining is going to occur to split that surplus. And there are many bargaining solutions that, that exist. So if you've taken game theory, you must have seen that there are many ways in which two parties can bargain over, uh, over a pie. Um, and um, so in the labor market literature, you can also see that many different types of bargaining solutions have been used. One that's used pretty commonly uh, is Nash bargaining. Um, so either standard Nash bargaining or generalized uh, Nash bargaining. Okay, so that's something that you find very often. The problem with Nash bargaining is that it's a little bit clunky in matching models. Um, there are various situations in which Nash bargaining doesn't work too well. So if you have large firms, it's complicated to do Nash bargaining. If you have workers who are averse to risk, something that we'll see when we study unemployment insurance, it's complicated to do Nash bargaining. So instead of using uh, Nash bargaining, we're going to take a bargaining solution that's a little bit simpler, but that's much more flexible and much more robust that we can use in many setups. Okay? Uh, so here, we'll just assume that we'll have division of surplus. Okay? So we'll assume that uh, bargaining between worker and firms leads to surplus sharing. Okay, uh, so we are going to assume that when there is bargaining, uh, so wedge bargaining is, oops, sorry. That's always between worker and a firm. Uh, right, so we'll assume that when there is worker and firm and they bargain together, the way that the bargaining split is going to be determined is through surplus sharing. Okay, and historically, actually, the first paper 
to introduce a wedge bargaining in a matching model used exactly that, uh, that bargaining solution. Uh, so the, this paper was Diamond, a paper by Peter Diamond in 1982. And uh, Peter Diamond assumed that when worker and firm bargained together, the way the solution of the bargaining was determined was through surplus sharing. Okay? So it's a historical way to resolve that bargaining, uh, that bargaining problem between worker and firm. Okay? So we're going to use a surplus sharing solution. So how does that solution work? Well, it's very simple. Um, it means that the way it works, when we have surplus sharing, So if we denote by f, curly f, the surplus captured by the firm, once there is a bargaining, if we denote by curly w, the surplus captured by the worker, when we have bargaining, and if we denote by curly s, the total surplus from, from a worker firm a match. So of course, curly S is a sum of curly F plus curly W because it's a total surplus, right? Well, when we have surplus sharing, then we'll, uh, we'll have that the the surplus that the firm is going to capture is going to be 1 minus beta times the total surplus. The surplus that the worker is going to capture is going to be beta times the total surplus, where beta, which is between 0 and 1, it's a parameter that we call the bargaining power the bargaining power of the worker. Okay, so it's a very simple, uh, it's a very simple solution. You have a total surplus S, which if you want is the size of the pie that the worker and the firm bargain over. Workers are given this bargaining power, which we call beta, um, and workers are going to take away a share beta of the pie. Firms are going to take away a share one minus beta of the pie. Okay, so that's really uh, quite simple. Okay, so um, what is that total surplus in the matching model? And hence, what is the way that comes out of that bargaining through this surplus sharing solution. So we can figure this out. Alright, so let's try to solve for what the wage would be in a world like this in which there is surplus sharing. Okay, so everybody, all workers and firms share the surplus. Okay, so we need to introduce just a tad of notation before we can actually solve for the um, bargaining power. So. Um, what do we have in terms of uh, terms of notation that we need to introduce? So um, first of all, remember that um, when you have a worker, the worker is going to produce the production function. So we're going to call MPL the marginal product of labor. Just to simplify. So um, that marginal product of labor with the type of production function that we've introduced, that would be uh, MPL is going to be equal to A and alpha minus one. So this would be with a general production function with some parameter alpha in zero one. And then if it turns out that alpha is equal to one, such that you have a linear production function, then MPL will just be equal to A, which is actually um, so that's alpha equal 1. That's actually a very common uh, assumption in the literature. Okay. 
Okay. Um, but anyway, doesn't matter which case we're in. Here we're just going to uh, to call that NPL. So that's one part of the worker part. Uh, something that's going to be another result that's going to be useful is the link between the wage and the marginal product of labor. And we know that uh, firms are always maximizing profit. And the first order condition gives the uh, of the you know profit maximi maximization problem gives the optimal size for, for the firm and so um, and that links and that first order condition is going to link the marginal product of labor to the wage that firms have to pay uh, and we, and so we have to remember that link that's going to be very important so the first order condition FOC from uh, profit maximization <coughs> remember that the first order condition was that the marginal product of labor minus 1 plus tau of theta times w was equal to 0 so it means that when firms are maximizing profit in fact when they are on their labor demand and then the marginal product of labor is equal to 1 plus tau. Let's just call it tau to uh, simplify times W, where tau is a recruiter producer ratio. Okay? Uh, and so tau is a recruiter producer ratio, and so something that's going to be helpful to remember. Uh, is that tau is equal to something that we saw it's equal to r times s divided by q of theta minus r times s okay something that we derived uh, a while ago okay well r is the recruiting cost s is the job separation rate and q of theta is the vacancy filling rate okay something that will have been uh, will become useful in a second. Okay, so we have the bargaining power. We have the marginal product of labor. We have the link between the wage and the marginal product of labor here. Um, so another parameter that's going to play a big role is uh, z. It's a new parameter that we haven't talked about before. And um, this is the value of unemployment. For workers. And this is another parameter. So, what does Z capture? You know, what could be a value of unemployment? Well, first you could have uh, unemployment benefits. And other benefits that are available to uh, unemployed. Okay, so that means that if you're unemployed, you don't get a salary, but you get these government benefits, and that makes Z uh, positive. Um, Z could also be positive if unemployed workers they enjoy uh, they enjoy being unemployed, they enjoy the extra leisure that comes from unemployment. Okay, and um, Z could also be positive if uh, unemployed workers they don't you know enjoy leisure but instead they, they benefit from home production so they are at home and they produce stuff at home that's valuable to them so you know maybe they cook at home and hence uh, you know they don't need to go and eat outside and so that money you know, that home production you know, is valuable maybe they uh, do you know maybe they do other things at home that's valuable uh, and that replaces stuff that they would have bought on uh, the market usually. And so through home production, unemployment may also be uh, valuable. You know, maybe they actually produce stuff that they are selling you know, on the internet or things like this. And maybe they get uh, an ex extra education when they are unemployed to try to uh, improve their, uh, their skills and their CV. So through all of these things, Unemployment could have some benefits to the unemployed. So in all these situations, 
that tends to push the uh, towards zero. But you know, z doesn't have to be positive. Um, there is also a lot of evidence that uh, being unemployed is a very traumatic experience. Um, so first, you know, it's possible that when you are unemployed, you lose uh, human capital. So you know, you're not on the job, you don't accumulate experience. Maybe you're losing some of your skills, and so that could make unemployment quite costly. Um, we know that a lot of people derive um, their sense of self, their identity from their job. Uh, for many people, what job they do is very important and um, they derive a sense of purpose from their job. And so if you don't have a job, then all your sense of purpose and maybe your identity is, is straightened. Um, and as a result, being an employee could be very costly uh, because of that and it could lead to um, lower uh, mental health and then down the line, uh, lower physical health as well. And in fact, there is a lot of empirical evidence that um, people who are unemployed are very unhappy in general. Uh, unemployment is a very traumatic experience. Okay? And in that case, uh, Z, the value of unemployment, could be, uh, even, could be negative. Okay? So we could have... Uh, Your mental health, physical health, uh, from the trauma of unemployment. Okay, and um, if this is a dominating factor, you know, if people don't maybe collect their benefits, they don't enjoy leisure, they don't, they don't very productive at home, but they just really suffer from the trauma of unemployment. Uh, the lack, the lack of jobs, if it's really waiting on them, then you could have, uh, in that case, here you could have Z that's even negative. So Z is some parameter that could be positive or negative depending on how uh, the unemployed workers cope with unemployment. That parameter is going to be very important as we look at um, surplus sharing.